Hi, Darren. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Mod TV today to talk about disruption. And we're also pleased to have you talk about your work. Uh, it feels like at the moment your varied interests of expertise are coming to the fore. Can you let us know what sparked your interest in these fields? Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, I've wanted to be a scientist probably ever since I was a kid. You know, I was one of those classic kids that was curious about how things worked and how nature worked. And um, that led me to study science. And then um, I guess the sort of, for me, the ultimate form of that is understanding how our own bodies work. And so that led me into physiology and biochemistry and molecular biology. And, and that's where my research interest took off from there. And you know, if you want, uh, want to understand how the body works, it's good to study when it doesn't work in diseases. So, you know, I've worked on cancer for a long time. It's been my main research focus. Um, and as part of working on cancer, you, you end up doing a lot of speaking to people about research. You know, cancer is one of those diseases that affects an awful lot of people. So, you know, we like to engage with people to help them uh, understand the research we do. We also like to engage with people to help them inform the research we do. So we like to get feedback on the questions we're asking. Um, and also, you know, to raise public awareness of our research and to helpfully raise some funds for doing our research as well. So I started to get a lot of practice in doing public facing stuff uh, in person and on the radio and on TV and stuff like that. So I've been doing that for a long time and um, found that I really enjoy it. And I really sort of it's a really interesting and exciting part of what I do. And then when a, you know, when a crisis comes along, like the, the COVID crisis that we've been living to, living through, there's there's, I guess, a lot of demand for uh, people to be able to take really complex and rapidly evolving scientific information and break it down in a way that helps people understand what's going on, you know. So especially we've seen with COVID, you know, the information is just like a fire hose of stuff coming out. And to be able to try and grab that and help people wade through it and figure out what is relevant for them and help them make decisions is kind of a really important thing to do. So in some ways, the timing was right. It's not just me. There's a lot of people have been, uh, you know, doing this over the last few months. Um, and we've been learning a lot in the process as well, actually. And uh, maybe if you can think back to a few months ago when we were prior to this and tell us a little bit more about your current role at the University of New South Wales. So I'm a you know classic track academic. I spend some of my time teaching. I spend um, some of my time researching, um, you know, running a, a small research group and writing papers and writing grant applications and all the stuff that goes with that. Um, and as I said, we've worked on cancer for a long time. We're very interested in a system that cancer cells use for, for breaking down protein and turning over protein and how that affects the way metabolism works. Um, and more recently, that's taken us into working on motor neuron disease, believe it or not. There's some similarities at the really basic biochemical level between what goes wrong in cells in those diseases. Um, so we've been doing a lot of that. And a part of what we do in that research is to use a lot of viruses. So we actually engineer and build a lot of designer viruses, both as research tools and also to try and make gene therapies. Um, viruses are really good ways of jumping bits of genetic material around between different things. And so we've spent a lot of time working on viruses, building viruses, understanding how they work. And so um, a lot of that came together, if you like, in the current crisis. It helps to be able to pull those different things together. Yeah, it was interesting. I heard the other day um, that they, they kind of could trace back um, the the kind of uh, cause or um, for some of the uh, COVID cases through um, genome, th like through genome research as well. So they're using it kind of at the other end to get back to it. Yeah, there's a huge interest in using genomics. Um, you know, the the testing that the, the rapid testing that's being done is a is an RNA based or geno genome based test. But when they're tracking outbreaks, so particularly the outbreak that's happening in Victoria in the moment in Melbourne. They're using genomics heavily because the, the virus has a signature genome sequence, if you like. Um, and that sequence, you can, you can actually track which people are getting which sort of small different variants of the virus. As the virus copies itself and moves from patient to patient, it starts to accumulate small little changes in its nuclear um, uh, RNA sequence. And we can track those and start to draw family trees, if you like, of people based on which sort of slight variants of the virus they've got. And so it helps people who are doing disease tracing can find out where the you know source of that virus in each individual is coming from, which is a really helpful thing in trying to shut, shut down the transmission of the virus. It's amazing. I like this is all I'm sure happening at a very um, minuscule level uh, and sort of much smaller and, and deeper than, than my understanding or perhaps, um, you know, 
uh, the person on the streets understanding. Maybe uh, I guess that's where we get back to your your work in media and um, public communication um, of science. Maybe you could talk a little bit about where that has taken you and how that's uh, helped you in, in your research or your thought about science. Yeah, it's a real um, one thing I hadn't really appreciated when I first started doing uh, communication type stuff is how much the skills I built doing public facing communication would, would help me as a scientist. So, you know, your role as a scientist isn't just doing experiments and analyzing data. You have to tell people what you've done with all that analysis um, and you have to convince people to give you money. And you also start to influence policy and, um, you know, it plays out in all sorts of ways. And so the sort of skills you learn in written communication in the sort of communication we're doing now um, become really important as a scientist. And, and in fact, um, to, to make that case for that, you know, really old school academic model that a lot of people are trying to break apart at the moment of having researchers and teachers doing the same thing at the same time. The stuff that I started doing in media talking about cancer led me into a research project um, through some teaching that I was doing. So I get my third year students who are learning about cancer pathology to do a, an analysis of the way that the media represent cancer research. Um, and that led me into a research project. And so there's a, sort of this full circle of, of the communication work influencing the teaching, which is now influencing my own research. Um, so that's been a really fascinating thing to, to watch evolve. Um, and I guess it's, it's, part of, it's part of our responsibility as scientists. You know, we use a lot of public funding. We have a responsibility to tell people what we do with that funding. And we also have a responsibility to use our training and our knowledge and our expertise to help um, translate information, to help people make sort of um, informed decisions, I guess. Um, and that really comes to the fore in a crisis. Absolutely, it's really important to yeah consider that that sense of the dual responsibility of you know doing the doing the work that you're doing and also being able to communicate it and talk about it to the public. Um, so, what do you reckon, Darren, has been the most challenging aspect of communicating around, particularly COVID nineteen in, in this year, and how do you reckon that would compare with um, other other examples of um, um, yeah public science issues you've had to communicate? I think the two, well, probably, there's probably three that I can think of straight away that come to mind. One is the, um, just the pace, the rapid pace that the information is coming out. Um, the real thirst for knowledge. So people want, you know, we've seen this um, emergence of science being um, communicated to people at a much faster rate than it normally is. You know, normally researchers like me write a research paper and it takes months or even years before it sees the light of day. Um, and we're now seeing with various online platforms and in a, in a crisis situation that almost a breakdown of that model, people are just putting information out really fast. And we've even seen stuff coming out, you know, by press release, which is really not optimal, but it's what happens. And, and so that's driving a really incredible pace of information. So, you know, to be able to get that information, try and understand it and then try and present it back to people is a real challenge. Um, that's been kind of terrifying, to be honest, a lot of the time. Um, I think the other thing that's made it really interesting is that there's an incredible, I, I've certainly felt, and I know talking to colleagues, an incredible pressure to get the story right and to not make myself the story. Um, so, you know, it's become incredibly politicised as well in a lot of cases and incredibly polarised politically. You know, think about the issue of face masks and think about the issue of the hydroxychloroquine drug that everyone was talking about. Things became really rapidly polarised. Mm. Um and so there's been a real, in my mind, a real sense of not wanting to fall into that um, storyline, if you like, or that narrative around the disease and to really try and stick to facts. Of, so I, I've sort of, you know, I've got a little bit of a mantra that I work with, which is to try and um, amplify facts, elevate experts. Uh, and so when you hear the chief medical officer come out with advice, I try to amplify that advice. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to stand out and say, well, he, that's not the right thing to say. That's, uh, that's not helpful in this situation. Um, and, and so... There have been two of the really big things. Um, the other thing that I think has been really, really challenging, and I don't think we know how to deal with this yet, is the rise or the re-emergence, if you like, of the sort of, you know, a lot of conspiracy theories and a lot of really horrible misinformation that's out there around, you know, the source of the virus, around treatments, even, you know, people claiming that the thing's a hoax. Um, that has been really, really challenging. And a lot of people are trying to figure out how to counter that. And it's a really difficult thing to do. Absolutely. And yeah, with the, you know, social media, with the internet, with all these, you know, platforms and, and ways of sharing information so quickly, like you're saying, it makes it, yeah, incredibly complex to, yeah, combat misinformation or um, make sure that the right information 
is being shared in, at, at such a difficult time for that anyway. Um, so you've talked about how you as a science communicator have um, sort of navigated that yourself. How do you think the public um, or people in general should, um, might navigate these kind of complexities and challenges? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think we're sort of learning as we go in some ways. I think the, you know, you mentioned social media. I think the social media companies have a really big responsibility and a big role to play here. And, and I think they, they've really dropped the ball. They are slowly starting to catch up. So we've seen a lot of social media platforms now starting to tag various content with little flags that say, look, this is these are places to go for accurate information. But, you know, there's an incredibly big industry out there now about, people who know how to manipulate the algorithms in, in social media to get a message out that they want to get out. And there's, you know, there's some bad actors at work as well, you know, and speaking of politics, we, you know, we saw early in the piece, um, some of the conspiracy stuff around 5G telephone networks, for example, there was pretty good evidence that a lot of that was, was politically motivated and coming from Russia and, and other places like that. Um, so, you know, you're not just dealing with, with sort of crackpots in their bedrooms, Googling stuff and then spreading rumors. You're talking about sort of highly coordinated um, campaigns that are going on and, and so that's that really hard stuff to counter um, I guess the the you know what I always come back to is to um, to for people to try and rely on a trusted on trusted sources of information um, to not look for the outlier or the or the sort of um, you know the, the the kind of the kind of bit of information or the or the narrative or the story that doesn't match everything else that's going on I mean people we have a psychological bias to want to grab hold of things like that, especially under conditions of stress and anxiety. Um, it's not necessarily a helpful trait that we all possess in our brains to want to chase down those kind of stories. They make us feel better. They make us feel empowered. And, and so that's um, understandable. Um, you, you know, we say listen to experts and listen to people that are trusted, but I think we also, as experts ourselves, need to understand that people have had bad experiences and, and so they've lost some of that trust in expertise. And so we need to find better ways to engage those people as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and following from that, I suppose, how do you think that um, events such as COVID um, have impacted or, or can impact um, both public and I guess also governmental um, trust of science or trust in science and how can this trust kind of vary um, issue to issue? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think we don't, probably don't, have a full handle on how that's going to look yet because part of it will be a retrospective analysis but there's certainly some really interesting survey data out there already around public trust and who people trust and how that trust is changing you know across the course of the pandemic and and how it changes in different parts of the world as well and and thankfully i mean from my perspective thankfully scientists and doctors still come out right up on top so you know if you ask people uh, their levels of trust, they're very, very high reported levels of trust in scientists and doctors, not so much in politicians, although that did actually go up quite a lot in some of the data I've seen. Um, and I think that depended heavily on the particular leader or the particular medical officer that was speaking and that a lot of it about the manner in which they, they did their communication. And I think from my perspective, it was really fascinating to watch early on in the crisis, the, the way that the um, both the content and the style of the communication communication coming from the prime minister and the premiers and things really very quickly evolved as they were sort of figuring out what worked and what didn't and and how they could influence people's decisions i think that was a a really fascinating thing to watch take place in real time and i'm sure they probably when they reflect they'll really have a good think about what worked and what didn't um and you could see different leadership styles playing out um you know because people people are stressed they, they you know we saw panic buying and all that sort of stuff going on that's it's a reflection of, of that stress and anxiety and and so um, people need to have a trusted voice they can listen to. They're looking for that trusted voice. And um, I think the sort of the empathetic style of communication seemed to work quite well. That sort of standing up, you know, bossing people around, telling people what to do didn't seem to work so well. So that, that's been absolutely fascinating to watch unfold, actually. And I, I really look forward to the post hoc analysis that will come out over the next year or two about what really worked in, in that space and in fighting the conspiracy stuff as well. Yeah, I look forward to that too. I hope there is yeah. some kind of reporting or research done around that. Around yeah, there's a lot, a lot of people itself. looking at it at the moment, so I'm sure there'll be some great stuff to read. That's really good to hear. Um, so we've just got a question from the audience as well, audience member. Um, they're asking, do you think that government trust in science about COVID could lead to more trust in science around climate change? Wow, isn't that a great question? Um, to, in my mind, 
Um, there's two big differences between the, the COVID situation and the climate situation. Um, one is I think we need to, you know, be reminded and appreciate that there was an incredibly well-resourced, um, well-coordinated effort to undermine climate science um, in order to protect, you know, some very large companies and their, and their profit margins. Um, and so we need to acknowledge that right at the start. And that's a hard thing to, to come up against. The other big obvious difference is that, you know, as a scientist, I, I look at the data around climate change and the predictions around climate change, and there's a catastrophe headed our way. Now, the, the problem is that catastrophe is some way down the track. And I think a lot of people are having trouble connecting that reality or that potential reality with, um, you know, what their decisions are in real time. Um, and that particularly plays out in the political space where the, you know, political timeframes are much, much shorter than the timeframes you need to get action on a, on a big issue like climate change. Whereas, you know, you can see with, with the COVID situation, a decision that was made three weeks ago has an incredibly important impact um, in the present day. So, and the decisions we make now will play out in, in very big ways in a couple of weeks time. And I think that changes people's behavior and that changes people's perception of risk as well, I suspect. And so that they're making, uh, they're very, very much more conscious of those short-term effects of the decisions they make. And I think with, with climate particularly, um, a part of it is lost in that, in that long-term time frame. So to answer the question, I guess my hope is that what we're learning from our response to COVID will partly inform our response to climate. And, and the other thing we're seeing is, you know, if you talk about development of vaccines and things, part of our response to COVID has depended on having capacity there to respond when this thing happened. And so I think there's acknowledgement now that we need to be careful to build that capacity into our public health systems and into our environmental protection systems so that when things do really go wrong, we've got some backup there. We don't have to build it from scratch when it happens. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. There is something about, and perhaps it's just human nature that, um, Often people need to uh, gain an understanding through experiencing something. They kind of uh, have to personally experience something uh, to gain that understanding. And then also, yeah, like you're saying, they like to see an immediacy of their actions. If they're being asked to do something, they want to see the result um, mm -hmm. quite quickly. Yeah. yeah. And so Definitely. I guess in terms of uh, what you've said already and, and those ideas, are there any um, specific methods or messages that we should be focusing on to improve public understanding? You, you spoke about your little mantra before. Is there anything else about that? I think, um, I mean, that's a good place. That's certainly a good place to start. I, I think in terms of dealing with the misinformation that's out there, I think we could be a lot more considered in the way that we deal with um, sharing links and sharing or amplifying misinformation, amplifying conspiracy and things, even in, in the course of trying to counter it, um, you know, there's some pretty good evidence out there by, by a lot of people now that, you know, in the course of trying to counter myths or misinformation, you can inadvertently actually amplify it and reinforce it in people's minds. Um, and so there's a number of different techniques out there for doing that. You know, one of the ones I, I'm, I'm conscious of using is a thing called a truth sandwich, where if you're going to tell somebody, you know, you're going to talk about 5G, 5G conspiracy or something, you sandwich that misinformation in between the, the right information. So you tell people the good stuff first, then you say, look, I'm going to tell you about this conspiracy theory or about this misinformation, and then you back that up again. And, and there's some evidence out there that that might be a slightly more effective way of doing it. Um, so that's definitely something to, to remember. And then, you know, the obvious one for people like me is to really cut out the jargon and really try to, what I try to do is put myself in the shoes of the person who's looking, watching, listening, and try to understand what it is that they want to get out of me and what the information is that they're looking for. And then I try to put it in terms that they'll be able to relate to. Um, I think that, I hope that works. I don't actually know if that works. I hope it works. That's my, certainly my approach to it anyway. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. I think, I think, I think it does work. So thank you. Um, <laughs> and, and I guess uh, also, um, I guess we're looking at like a future of messaging, the future of information dissemination. Um, and I guess, yeah. Do you think, I remember a time when um, perhaps you, you could just look at the news and look at information and, and the information you received, you could relatively trust. I think now at where our eyes are being opened to perhaps that wasn't totally the case, but it felt like more the case. Uh, in the past and now there's just yeah so much information and we don't know how to trust it do you think we'll ever have a time where we can uh, go to a trusted source or or you know will there be a, a simpler time for the end user of that information 
I don't think so. And I think this comes back to, and there's a lot smarter people than me have been studying the media around this, but I think it comes back to the fragmenting of audiences. So, you know, if you go back not that far in time, people got their news from a few different TV channels or a few different newspapers. And then the internet came along and that broadened our exposure to lots of different newspapers around the world and TV channels and now to things like we're doing right now, um, along with social media. And so people can really build a bubble of information. You know, they can really just um, insulate themselves into a stream of information that matches their worldview um, without even realizing they're doing it. And we, we all do it without realizing we're doing it. Um, and that's really hard to counter because if you can't break through those bubbles, we're going to just become further and further fragmented. And the nature of the way things are being delivered now, we're, you know, we just, most people under a certain age don't watch the TV news. They don't read the newspaper. They get their information online. Um, and I think that that's a real challenge for us. Um, I think the other thing we need to be better at doing, you know, it's very hard to counter misinformation once it's out there. It takes a lot more effort to stop it than it does to block it in the first place. So I think I'd, one thing I'd like to see is a lot more effort going to trying to stop the information at its source, that misinformation, before it gets out there, before it gets legs and really spreads through the online communities and, and through social media. Uh, that, that's not an easy thing to do, I'd say as well. It's <laughs> a really tricky thing to do. I wish I knew how to do that better. But, I, you know, I have, I have nightmares some mornings. I wake up and I turn on the news or I look online and I see some story that's out there. And I, you just know in the gut, in your gut, that that's going to take off around the world. And a lot of people like me are going to have to spend an awful lot of time trying to hose it down and, and try to put out the fires and try to help people see through it um, it's a really tricky thing to do and, and so that would be a great thing to for us all to get better at I guess and also to look at people's motivations for spreading information you know are people telling you something because they're making a profit out of it are they telling you something because they stand to gain political advantage from it I think if we all spend a little bit more time looking at, um, at motivations I think that would probably help us a bit as well definitely and I suppose um, yeah this is a very broad question um, but be as specific as you like about um, whether this is to do with, you know, the future of science communication or the future of, um, you know, how misinformation may, yeah, we can stop it or find ways to deal with it more effectively. Um, but yeah, how do you kind of see the future or I suppose the next, you know, couple of years um, in this sense? Um, one, one thing I'd really like to see is um, scientists particularly, so, so people that do have expertise and do have gravitas or, if, or, or you know, runs on the board um, to get better at communicating with people, to not just stand up and go, I'm an expert, listen to me because I'm telling you what I know, but to look at the way, and you know, I've written about this and talked about this a lot, to look at the way that um, you know, Instagram influencers and, and health influencers work, they're incredibly effective communicators. You know, I think we can learn a lot from the way they do things and I'd love to see more scientists and medicos and people providing that really um, that have the expertise and the knowledge to get better at, at communicating that and turn it more into a conversation rather than just a broadcast of his his very important information from a very important person. I think that would probably help. Um, so that's really something I'd like to see happen. It's something I'd definitely focus on a lot. Um, so that'd be a good starting point, I guess. That sounds like a very good starting point to me and kind of yeah, yeah assessing yeah, the, the, again, coming back to that sense of responsibility and the role that you have as a public facing or, you know, yeah, as a, as a researcher or a scientist or a, someone communicating. And I think we are, we are getting, we are yeah. definitely getting better at it. I think the other thing that's really important on that is that people will trust people they can relate to. And so we need to have a much greater diversity of voices out there doing this sort of stuff. Not that, you know, pale male and stale like me. Because um, people will trust information if it's coming from someone that they can relate to a lot more closely. So I think that's also important, you know, to, to get a, a bigger breadth of voices out there talking about this stuff would also be a great thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, Darren, what's next for your own teaching and research projects? What's coming up? So t teaching, we've just gone through this uh, quite challenging episode of having to shift everything online because our students now are at the end of a Zoom call, mm -hmm. unfortunately not in a classroom or in a lecture theatre or in a lab. So that's, that's, I mean, that's challenging for us. It's a lot of work. It's even more challenging for the students. So we're, we're all learning a very steep curve on a very steep learning curve about how to do that. Um, research wise, um, we've got a couple of projects that we're on that, that are real, that really fascinate me. So, so one, we're working on a gene therapy for motor neuron disease, which is a horrible incurable um neurodegenerative condition 
uh, and we've got a particular angle on how we think that disease works. And so we're now testing various ways to, to attack that sort of molecular lesion right at the heart of that disease. Um, and I guess we're sort of waiting, I guess we'll know in the next year or so if that approach is, is worth continuing or not. So that's, that's a really exciting angle for us. Um, and in the cancer space, you know, cancer is just, it's going in so many interesting directions with, with genomics and with understanding cancer metabolism and immunotherapy and how the immune system and the tumors um, interact with each other. So that's something we're, we're very interested in, in chasing always, you know, nothing ever stands still in research. That's one of the things we love most about it. Uh, that's so great. It sounds, it sounds very, very busy. sounds like you're going to be very yeah. busy, but yeah, it sounds definitely. exciting as well. And uh, where, where, can, where can we find out more about um, everything you've been talking about today? Maybe there's a couple of places you could lead us to. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the stuff that I'm writing about is, you know, conversation and the ABC. There's, there's, that's, that sort of stuff's up there for people to look at. Um, you know, in terms of uh, trusted information, I guess when it comes to, say, cancer research, the type of stuff that, that I'm talking about from a research perspective, um, the state cancer institutes, um, the Cancer Australia have fantastic information. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare have fantastic information. Um, you know, not not the sort of celebrity chefs and people like that probably aren't the people to turn to for that. Um, I'd say, um, you know, when it comes to COVID, I think the the state the state and federal health departments and the chief medical officers are doing a, a pretty amazing job under pretty incredible pressure. I have to say, and, and you know, they cop it occasionally for the way they're doing things, but I have to say. You know, anyone that thinks they want their job at the moment is probably crackers. It's an incredibly difficult job uh, with huge consequences. So I think, you know, also listening to what they're doing. And I think the most important advice I could give to people out there trying to, you know, deal with this sort of fire hose of information that we're all trying to deal with is to keep an adaptive mindset. You know, the thing about science is that what's true now might not be true in six months time. Um, and the advice that we're giving now is likely to change as we understand more about a particular disease or the way to treat or the way to uh, prevent infection. And so it's really good not to get stuck in a particular way of thinking and to, and to really stay adaptive and to stay uh, kind of agile in your thinking, I guess, is a, is a good way to, to think about it. Definitely. Well, thank you, Dan. We really appreciated you coming on to the program this afternoon and spending some time. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. Thanks so much.